Hello and welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast, where popular culture meets the First World War. I'm Angus Wallace and with me as ever is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshall and joining us today is, is Beth Wyatt. Hello Beth. So we're going to be discussing the representation of the landscape of war in Sam Mendes' film 1917. Um Beth, uh, thanks for joining us. Now, you, you've written about the uh, landscape of the Western Front and Gallipoli, discussing British soldiers' emotional experiences. Um, Shall we start with how did you how did you come to that topic? So it's actually from um, a book, as I'm sure um, most of us, that's happened when we've gone into a new area of research. Um, so it was a narrative book called Where Poppies Blow um, by John Lewis Stample. And I just yeah, came across it in a bookshop one day. It had a very inviting cover with all flowers and animals and <laughs> um, it was just another an area of the war that I just had ever crossed my mind really so I was quite intrigued um, to learn more um, and um, yeah I just found it really fascinating um, learning how soldiers interacted with nature during the war and um, how it kind of affected their emotional experiences and so that's what led me to um, do my own research looking at the Western Front and Gallipoli. I mean, it's yeah. Your your uh, Emma was it, your thesis. You said it was really interesting. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. it. Had had echoes of the only letter we have from the First World War from my grandfather, and the and uh, of which he he typically it's almost like he's he's almost writing tropes as they happened. Talks about the mud up to his nether regions, and then moved on to talk about cake, weather, and food. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Uh, and in two pages, I'm not sure there's any punctuation through the whole thing. Uh, so let, let's move on to 1917. So if I've summarised the plot as short as possible, it's basically the Germans have withdrawn to create a new shorter line and two British runners are sent from behind their own lines through the British and the old German front line into the countryside beyond to locate the, a British battalion to call off the attack. So we kind of go from behind the one set of lines to behind a, 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 another set of lines. And and it's a film that sort of moves beyond focusing directly on trench life, I think is probably fair to say. Um, though, uh, as, as Dan Snow put it in his introduction uh, of, of, of his History Hit podcast, it, it wanders close to some old tropes of the war, which um, I'm not sure if it was flattering or not when he was talking to Sam Mendes when he sort of said that. Um, but there we go. Um, so where, where do we where do we want to begin? How does Sam Mendes use the landscape? Is there any precedence? Maybe we should go backwards. Is there any precedence for what Sam Mendes is doing with the landscape? Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, it kind of goes on from um, a lot of modern First World War films in, um, you know, kind of focusing on the, um, the devastation and horror um, kind of landscape idea. So I find it quite interesting in um, a Sam Mendes short interview with the Imperial War Museum, he described how he wanted to represent in the film um, the devastation of the landscape as took place in the war. Um, so there's a lot of very um, visceral graphic scenes of the big craters and, and mud and just, you know, obliterated trees and just very kind of hard hitting um, visual scenes, which kind of match what he was talking about there. But I actually found it quite interesting, even though he's, he spoke about that's what he was trying to represent. When I went to the cinema and watched the film, I was just really struck by... Um, how it used landscape in actually a way quite different from other classical films I've seen, where, as you said, it kind of moves on from the trenches, the dugouts um, into wider landscapes, and it kind of sets the trenches more in their setting. And there's actually, even the beginning and the end, you have um, one of the main characters, Schofield, sitting up against the tree in this beautiful landscape, flowers and um, greenery. Those kind of scenes just struck me as being entirely different from the um, the kind of films that I've seen before. It's, it's quite interesting, actually, because you talk about the beginning of the film. And for me, one of the most memorable moments is the point of entry into the trenches, where, you know, he goes from this field with a tree in it and the trench just sort of appears in the field. And that, in some ways, is far more striking than any of the, the more traditional representations of devastated landscape it's it's this sort of quite quiet interjection of the war into the landscape that really struck me when i i saw the film so i yeah i it's very interesting that it's not necessarily the 
the more traditional tropes of, of destroyed land, a la a Paul Nash picture. It, it's the more bucolic, almost, representations of the landscape that really st- stick out, I think. When we did our popular film podcast, I spoke for far too long than anyone would ever reasonably want to listen about the the depth of field in um, Oh, What a Lovely War, that you know, you could see all the way up the hills and, and the like. I, I remember because I, I watched 1917 last night again and you end up with that same sense of, of depth and scale but it's always behind you it's in the direction that they're facing but you spend a lot of time with the camera facing at them and them heading towards you and you heading backwards so even with that trench scene it's the camera pulling back to show that it's just going to keep going and going and going and going and going all of the depth is in the other direction is in the direction that they're heading towards and it's quite often as the camera turns around you suddenly realize that you've reached a new point and you kind of understand the scale of what it is that you're that you're in amongst and they do that with the trench scene and the, the approach to the to the cherry farm as well do we know if, how uh, men reflected how close is the film reflecting upon men's memoirs of how they're remembered after the event or even during the event memoirs might not be the time you know they've obviously written it after whatever they've been is he drawing is this a piece of popular fiction that's drawing on these uh, memories of the time? Yeah, um, I know from um, the um, the interviews I've listened to with um, cast and crew um, that the film did draw quite heavily on um, soldiers' accounts, um, so both their diaries and memoirs, um, particularly at the Imperial War Museum. So definitely in that respect. Um, I'm not sure how um, far they kind of looked at landscape themes in the works, as um, that didn't specifically come up in their interviews, but Certainly from the accounts I've looked at, um, I was doing this research um, at the time I, I watched the film um, and I was really struck by how some of the, the use of the more um, positive idyllic landscapes reflected things I'd read myself from the men. Um, so in terms of memoirs, it's quite interesting how um, even amongst descriptions of um, very bleak landscapes, um, you still had some men saying that they um, they still kind of treasured um, and harboured some memories of, of positive landscape associations during the war as well. Um, and they remained kind of quite vivid in their memories. And so things like, you know, the sun rising over a particular landscape and the importance of um, birdsong to the men, for some of them, these things still stuck for them afterwards and not just the, um, the bleaker parts of their experiences. And then diaries as well, for example, um, I did find there were men who, obviously diaries have been well used in the field to describe the importance of particular things to the men and their morale, such as food and um, you know the weather, how that would kind of affect their mood and their day. Um, and I found for some men, kind of nature operates on a similar level where, you know, they'd be jotting down birds they'd seen, flowers they'd seen, um, and, and just kind of discussing those experiences as well. Do you remember an extraordinarily irritating interview, or at least, for, you know, from the professional historian's perspective? Um, it was by the script writer, I think, where just the way she was describing going into the Imperial War Museum and and encountering these letters and diaries as if nobody had ever seen any of these before and they were all hidden away and it was just sort of ah, this is you know someone who's used uh, you know, like you beth i've used a lot of these materials in my own work um and it, it was yeah really really quite frustrating to get their books and books and books you know john Lewis stemples for that matter uh books make use of this stuff um at least acknowledge that, that you're not the first but Am I right in thinking that the, the story itself is based on Mendy's grandfather, great grandfather? Or... If you listen to him talk, when you say loosely based, it, it's it's kind of a, a twenty word sentence, and he's written a, you know, there's a two hour film from my granddad was sent as a runner to call off an attack. Okay, and he's grown this enormous story from kind of literally a you know a couple of sentences so it's not in any sense his grandfather having these impressions of of the trenches it it, it is entirely built on other narratives and and i think i think even down to the fact that the period in time mendez goes through and looks for a period in time where there is more movement and that's why it is when it is nothing really to do with his 
any sort of family stories being passed down at it's that particular time. So it, it, it's a thread of an idea that he's fleshed out. My assumption is he's like the idea of doing a one camera move and then thought, let's somehow let's do it to the First World War. And he's had to find some point in time where there's plenty of movement to add in so he can add the landscapes. Um, and I also found um, in possibly the same script writer interview um, where I hadn't been aware of this before, where with, with that device of um, the two main characters, you know, they've got to go and be the runners and take this message to stop the attack. She briefly mentioned that in the interview, saying that um, herself, the director of the other team, they were very keen to have that as the storyline, um, not just as an event itself, but in order to... Um, kind of give I guess an anti-war um, message to kind of represent you know feelings today about um, about warfare um, as you're speaking about um, you know or quite um, understandably um, you know war shouldn't be a last resort it you know shouldn't be a resort at all and so it's quite interesting actually hearing that they hadn't just thought oh that makes you know an interesting dramatic story with um, with the runners mm-hmm. but they actually as many films do they wanted to use that to demonstrate a particular theme on, on warfare and obviously of the First World War itself. It's interesting because, you know, back to, to Angus's question about uh, uh, sort of precedence, um, you know, having just done our, uh, last month done our episode on, on better known films and looking at Gallipoli, where that idea of the runner um, and the, the need to carry messages across landscape is key to that film with its anti-war message that you know that 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 thesis that we were we were discussing a little bit last time of of the extent to which all these films reflect more on on what comes in between than it does on sort of the reality of war um if you will which does make it quite interesting that some of the claims that i think that are made to to to, to veracity and the truth about war um at least yeah that was one of the less irritating things about that interview is at least there was a certain amount of honesty about about the extent to which this was a, a retrospective view of the war as much as it that was being portrayed as much as it was of the truth of whatever that is of, of the war experience i think in that sense it, it's interesting that you, because if you consider 1917 coming out, you know, it's, 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 it was 2019 that it came out, wasn't it? It seems like, I mean, that seems like a very long time ago. Um, but it's, you know, in my head, it's coming out in about the same period of time as uh, They Should Not Grow Old. And both of them obviously do incredibly well, um, regardless of, you know, whatever historians might think about them. But also both of them have very different interactions with the idea of telling the truth about the war in that Thou Shall Not Grow Old attempts to kind of claim the, the, the historical authenticity high ground in a way that I don't necessarily think that 1917 does. It allows people to say, oh, wow, what a, what a realistic war film. And, you know, no film's ever going to come out and go, this is about the First World War. It's complete nonsense. You know, they're, they're, they're playing into that historical authenticity thing, but they're doing it in a different way, a way that I'm, I'm kind of finer with than I was with They National Grove. Oddly enough, I thought the inclusion of the landscape made it very much more into a Second World War film. It gives his reminiscence of, you know, Normandy-type blown-up houses and trucks moving and things, which actually harkens back, in fact, to the big parade, if we go back to that, because that's there's a lot of landscape in that and there's the trucks driving across the landscape, taking troops to the front kind of thing. So it's, a, it's a lot closer to to that depiction of war than, um, so to say, Gallipoli, which is sort of very much more at the front. One of the things I found, and I, I wonder if um, there's elements of this in Beth's research, is the use of the landscape as some kind of a cue for a conversation about home. So how kind of locating or dislocating the landscape is. And obviously, you know, the cherry trees one is the obvious one in that. Blake's talking about, you know, he knows all this stuff about cherry trees. And there's also a nice little kind of um, metaphor for the war in that, oh, they've chopped them all down. Does that mean there won't be any more? No, don't worry. There'll be even more of them once the, once the, um, once the stones rot. But I wonder how much soldiers use the landscape as either a way to connect back to home. Or, I mean, the French landscape, when you go into the countryside, is different to England in various parts. So, I mean, imagine it could have been fairly kind of dislocating to the extent that I know that various French soldiers during the war, when they went on leave to British areas, were pretty appalled to find that the British had basically 
changed the landscape of French towns and countryside to be slightly more kind of aesthetically pleasing towards British soldiers, to which I think the French response was, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um, you do realise we live here. But I wonder if, is there something about that, Beth, about the landscape is either, oh, this reminds me of home, or this reminds me of how far away I am from home, because this is just weird. It's not like being in the countryside in, I don't know, Sussex or Yorkshire or, or wherever it is that you've come from. Yeah, um, I actually saw um, both parts of that um, in my research. Um, and yeah, the cherry blossom scene um, was probably my favourite in the film, just because it it spoke to those themes that I've been researching. And yeah, it was really moving um, when um, well, Blake was kind of had such a powerful emotional reaction to um, to the space um, and was talking about his his mum's orchard back home um, and you know yeah trying to work out which type of cherry this tree was and um, even Schofield who um, you know was kind of asking him how do you know this um, <laughs> you know was um, was still even though he didn't really know anything about about the, the type of trees he was still you know moved as you said to kind of say oh they've cut them all down and will they grow back? But yeah, I, I really love that scene. Yeah, in my research, um, I, I've seen um, both of those in diaries and memoirs really, um, where there've been soldiers who um, would write and be like, wow, you know, the song reminds me of the chalk downs of Kent, but you know, noticing a few kind of differences in, in the types of trees and lanes. And yeah, then other soldiers talking about yeah, how completely different they found them to home. So that was, um, yeah, really moving to kind of show um, those instances in, um, you know, these obviously martial, often martial documents like diaries to see their, um, them kind of getting back into that civilian space and, you know, remembering with nostalgia um, memories of home, memories of home landscapes. Um, and I think that's, um, that's really interesting. In your research, Beth, do you, do you look at the... English landscape, and I, I, I'm thinking England specifically here, because there's been so much written about, you know, poets like Edward Thomas and, you know, Paul Fussell's discussion of, of the of the pastoral as as inspiration for the literary imagination during the war. But do you find descriptions of English landscape, do you look at descriptions of English landscape relative to French landscape. And, and the reason I ask is that cherry tree scene, I think I remember coming out of it thinking, what bit of England, where, where, do, where do cherries grow in England? What, what, what bit of English landscape? Because what I found in my research into this is there's a, re, when men write about home, it's a very, very localized, specific sense of home. Um, it is your mother's orchard or, you know, the, the village you come from rather than England as a whole. So, so I'm, I'm just wondering about, yeah, what, what, you've, what you found about that sort of specific landscape in your research and what comes out of that. Um, no, I definitely found that to be the case um, where soldiers, when they were comparing or contrasting to home, it was very much particular local um, spaces and landmarks that were important to them. Um, so um, one Gallipoli example was a soldier um, talking about a, um, a lovely kind of countryside space um, in Gallipoli, talking about some of the flowers they'd seen and being like, oh, these remind me of my garden in Chigwell. And then um, it was also the kind of markers of areas of the Western Front named after landmarks of home. So there was a, a soldier talking about um, an open space um, not far from Albert and saying it was called Hampstead Heath probably named by some homesick cockney um, <laughs> and um, yeah things like that and somewhere else a soldier kind of describing going round around the trenches and talking about it being like the maze at Hampton Court Palace so they're definitely using the kind of markers of um, local landscapes to, to describe and make sense of, of the, the, these new war spaces they're serving in which um, yeah I found that really moving. The British authorities I think recognised in advance that kind of weird that we're well, not all weird that kind of connection to particular parts of the country. Because if you think about the the recruitment post, which is called um, Isn't This Worth Fighting For, which has got a soldier in a kilt it's kind of pointing to like the countryside pine. But it's it's a Frankenstein's monster of a weird mishmash of stuff. It's like the South Downs with Wiltshire cottages and a soldier in a kilt. It's like, where, where are you? Where are you supposed to be at the moment? None of this exists. But this idea of England in particular is made up of these these cookie cutter things that will in some way inspire 
soldiers, but it doesn't actually have to exist anywhere. And, you know, you won't get soldiers in a kilt next to the South Downs and Wiltshire cottages because none of it exists in, in this way, but it exists enough to be recognisable. Can I, can I just point out that I used that poster as an example in the essay I wrote on um, the First World War uh, as it's remembered in Ambridge and the Archers. I'm not sure if these are the one, the online images, but there's a series of images illustrating places in Ambridge, this imagined, and I'm just wondering who are, you know, how much I need to explain the archers to our audience at this point, this imagined Midlands rural community um, where the uh, they commissioned an artist to, to create images of, of various buildings and farms. Um, and the local stately home and the church and things like that. And they're very much in the in the demotic of that poster. This is recognisably how, how England is visualised as propaganda. <laughs> um, and it's played out into, you know, 20th, 21st century understandings of an imagined bit of England, an entirely imaginative bit of England. I mean, you let me do an entire episode about Star Wars, so I can't imagine that we can begrudge you talking about the Archers. Well, no, it's it's more. Do we do we need to do do we have any non-British uh, audience members who are going to go the Archers? What's that? I mean, to be fair, we might have a number of British viewers who are always like the Archers. What's that? Well, well, you know, I'm sure it's on catch catch up on the BBC if someone wants to listen to 50 years of it. it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they've only got they they don't have that much catch up, unfortunately. I've been desperately trying to get hold of some of the episodes, sort of pre two thousand, because um, uh, I, w- I wanted to hear what the uh, they did around the seventy fifth anniversary of the armistice. Um, but uh, no, you can't get hold of, of it going that far back. But yeah, uh, seven o'clock, four nights a week at the moment. Uh, you can tune in on Radio Four and find out what's going on in Ambridge. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if uh, in the film. Nature's almost a signpost for safety for the troops. If you think about it, when it, when it's war, when things are blown up and there's shell holes, it, it it's a sign of tension. And when there's greenery, it's not. I wonder if if, if for men at the time, that's how they felt felt about uh, the landscape around and the nature. If you know, is it a a place of safety for them? Yeah, um, that's definitely the impression um, I get of um, of how some soldiers felt. So I had um, one account by, by this naturalist, which is really interesting, um, diary entries. And he wasn't even someone who was kind of at the front, um, you know, that often. And he described having to spend a few days, I think it's maybe 1917 or 18, in, in a really kind of, you know, war-stricken landscape. And, you know, he was writing of that was only three days and he was desperate to, to get out and, and kind of have some kind of aesthetic pleasure or satisfaction um, being in a, in a nicer landscape. And yeah, he was, you know, just there a few days and was, was desperate to um, to be in some nice greenery. So that definitely represented it. Um, and yeah, he was saying he couldn't believe how some people, you know, stuck it in um, being in you know really devastating landscapes for for long periods of time on end, um, and yeah, I had other men kind of talking about being in a in a, in a kind of decimated landscape. So one talking about being in a, a, a pretty devastated um, wooded area, and you know just trees, splinter trees everywhere, and then suddenly he just saw this patch of beautiful bright flowers and was you know really excited and collected a box to send home to his mum. And um, yeah, the kind of examples like that really show that, um, you know, I guess when, when their morale was um, was down and, you know, as you imagine it would be when you were serving in those areas where there's just nothing green to be seen and, and you know, the, the weaponry just, um, yeah, devastated it. That it must have just had a really nice emotional uplift, even if just for those few moments you just saw, you know, just saw some nature really. So yeah, I think that I think that could be quite powerful. And I think it was something that kind of offered hope as well. Like there's a lot of men who talk um about um you know hearing birds in the landscape and how soothing bird song could be um you know hearing them continue to sing while the all was still going on. And um yeah, I think it, it could kind of be a message of hope and particularly as well when the landscape started to change um where particular areas which may have had this fighting you know it then moved on to other areas and nature started to kind of renew itself and um, there were men later on who were a bit kind of veterans worried about that you know they wanted to recognize their old locations and make sure it was all still remembered but there um there are soldiers and accounts who 
who kind of speak with hope at seeing nature kind of you know begin again and, and start to renew and see trenches beginning to be covered with flowers again and so yeah I think nature kind of for some of them was the symbol of hope and regeneration which you know perhaps they um you know they could apply, apply to themselves. Just picking up on your point about uh bird song I can't remember in the film and I'm, I'm dreadful about um soundtracks in films it, it, it does that aspect to come out in the film is the, is there a bird song as as part of the film in in those more bucolic scenes or is it all just visual i can't remember actually really hearing um much birdsong in 1917 and um, i feel like yeah for a lot of the film there was just a very starring soundtrack um <laughs> so i don't really recall that side of things in in this film particularly but um i did find that the the um the landscape scenes of um, peaceful green fields i feel like the way the film um was kind of was shot so it was such immediacy like for example at the end where you see Schofield walking you know towards the, the tree it kind of the camera is quite close to the floor and you're just seeing kind of every break and um, every blade of bright green grass and yellow flowers i think they um it just i didn't really capture that bird song aspect for me i don't think but um the actual the visuals of the positive landscapes i thought yeah it captured them really kind of vividly um in those scenes before you all arrived me and angus were talking about the score for it and i was saying that i would love to sit to watch a version of the film that didn't have the music over the top because it's not the music isn't particularly intrusive but given the kind of the way that they set it up as like a hyper real real time two long shots experience you know, life doesn't come with a musical soundtrack. So I wonder how weird and creepy it would be without the sound over the top. Because the only birds I can think of are the crows of No Man's Land in it. Um, and I'm desperately racking my brain to think of if there was any birds singing when he was in the river, when he was drifting downstream or not. And I don't think there were. No, I think I can just just recall the kind of the rushing of of the water, and yeah, not really um, any any bird song there. I'm just wondering what the the scene just before that final scene where he's walking towards the the tree. Um, he walks through a very oddly placed casualty clearing station um, in terms of <laughs> geographies of the front. My memory of that is sort of, and and Chris, you'll have watched this a lot more recently than I I did. Um, just sort of a, a murmur that it's human voices at a, a low level is that right is am i remembering this correctly yeah i well, because as you as you approach the casualty clearing station as he starts going you become kind of aware of the the activity and uh, and the voices beyond but it's it's kind of like it's like the film version of, of murmuring voices of some of them come through incredibly clear to, you know, to point out that this guy's not going to make it or um, we need a doctor over here, stat, or, you know, something to, to show the horror of war rather than just like a bunch of voices going, like, 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 yeah, like exactly how it would be in real life. It, it, it's Hollywood murmur, which is like a, a background buzz and then incredibly important plot details. <laughs> the, 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 sound, the sound designers might have been conscious of the fact, do you remember the brouhaha over the soundtrack of the sound design and I think it was Birdsong, where they used the wrong birds that hadn't arrived in France at that time of the year? Uh, it might have been... Um, it's probably the same sound design as Dene or someone. It, they're probably very conscious that they don't want to get the wrong birds in, so they maybe uh, dialed down any bird noises. Because that was a, a remarkably big stink at the time, wasn't it? Oh, my good grief, they've used the wrong birds. Yeah, but if I can imagine ever um, waking up in the morning with the energy to care about that. But they did. That, there was a huge, huge thing in the media. That was one of my wife's clients had made the mistake. Uh, at the time. Um, it's the Hollywood frog problem, isn't it? In that everybody in the world thinks that frogs go ribbit because that's the noise that frogs make in South California and in near Hollywood. And that's whenever they had to make a film, regardless of where it was in the world, they go out and record frogs near Hollywood and that makes every frog in the world sound like that. There is something you sort of alluded to there about the compression of the space that we're talking about as well. You know, when you say, Jessica, that they, the aid station is remarkably close to the front line, it, you kind of have to suspend quite a lot of disbelief over the fact that you know they, he's essentially walked about eight miles in an uh, hour, just short of t t two hours. Um, so the landscape is in, in the film is very much on top of each other, 
And actually, it, 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 it this kind of not there's not a lot of sort of liminal space between the front line and not the front line. You're kind of at it, or it's green space. Well, um, at the start, there's quite a lot in the communication trenches. So, it, I mean, but but then at the end, it becomes very compressed, and there's no sort of communication trenches at, at the far end. And I mean, my complaint about that compression with the with the casualty clearing station is what it effectively does is writes the stretcher bearer and the field ambulance who create dressing stations manned by tent orderlies between the front line and the casualty clearing station. It just writes a whole group of, of servicemen out of the out of the narrative. And having just written a book about them, I found that quite annoying. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I, I don't know how in a film which, you know, as you say, time is compressed as well as, as space. I don't know how you, you represent, you know, the amount of space that actually the trench system takes up. We keep talking about how close, you know, things are to the front line. How, how do you represent that on screen? I just don't know. I like how chaotic they made the trenches, how busy and confusing and heavily populated as they move closer and closer to the front line in that kind of opening, is it 20 minutes, half hour? Kind of period of time um that was a really interesting because it, it could end up being a very claustrophobic experience if we think about what we were talking about with airlines of things like paths of glory which is a really claustrophobic film what it ends up doing is it, it, it's kind of the opposite because you're aware of how big everything around you is and how much space you you are compressed within which i thought was quite interesting is the closer they got to the front line and you know they go through a different regiment and a different regiment and there are people they're going up a down trench and somebody calls him an idiot and the, the, it's it's such a hive of activity rather than the idea that you know there's 12 guys sat in a front line trench and that's all that's all you get which i thought was interesting the other oddity about the uh trench i might be over reading this is the idea of modernity uh you know that 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 front line is all full of um barbed wire machine guns you know the 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 industry of war and then as you get further back you certainly as they go beyond the german uh lines it sort of disappears into sort of some strange agrarian idyll before we arrive back at the modernity of the of the town again so you have this idea of the landscape has been sort of uh uh sort of, sort of some agrarian thing that we should all strive for but it's not actually agrarian and that was actually something that i, I found quite interesting and i wonder if beth pastoral you pastor i was gonna say because <laughs> they're, they're in a forest at one point and that 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 whole singing scene where he encounters the man and they're they're, they're singing they're in woodland and we you know our images of all the woodlands bombed out of existence or shelled out of existence which Im is, image is accurate how much do trees survive i suppose is the question from your research, I mean, and yeah, I'm not sure if I have a, a sense of um, of the, the actuality, um, but yeah, I definitely think um, Fassbender's films before have kind of overplayed that, and um, where we do see see the men at the front, we're kind of yeah, we're getting no trees, or we're getting completely devastated trees, um, and yeah, definitely from some of the accounts I've read, um, you know, there's people describing landscapes in even in 1917 or 18. Um, spaces which um, you know which hadn't been touched by the war. Like, I guess we kind of have this idea where people talk of you know the Western Front, you know, just being like the natural landscapes just being devastated. Um, and yeah, as far as far as I've read, um, you know, also there were pockets which um, which weren't affected very much. There were those which may have been earlier, and, and then things have started to regenerate. Um, so yeah, that was a nice thing to see um, in the film where they did kind of yeah make, make that effort to um, to show. Yeah, a bit more kind of diversity of landscape, really. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that we need to take a group outing to Dillville Wood. Field field trip to the Western Front, is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Heritage, Heritage Lotter yeah. von Grant for a field trip to the... Yeah, we can go and see if we can find the waterfall on the <laughs> Somme. How, how, how good is your technical equipment for an outside broadcast, Angus? Fine, I can manage that. <laughs> <laughs> Right, as soon as we're all allowed to travel. <laughs> to wait nine months until we can go outside. Um, yeah, I, I could manage that. I was just about to say something about the, the the harking back of cherry blossoms. So obviously you have the conversation with um, Schofield and Blake in the cherry orchard where it's all been cut down. 
and the like. Um, and I, as a complete side, I remember because I went and watched it by myself in the cinema, and it was, I don't know, January, February time or something like that. And there were people sobbing in the cinema. There wasn't a huge number of people there sobbing in the cinema when Blake got killed. But I was like, have you never seen a war film before? Like literally five minutes ago, he was talking about how much he missed his parents and how much he was looking forward to going home. I mean, of course he's going to die. <laughs> of course he's going to die. He's not going to make it. Um, but I remember when then Schofield is floating down the river and he kind of reaches out and he's kind of picking up cherry blossoms and that kind of harks back to, to Blake and like, what it really reminded me of is the last scene in um, All Quiet on the Western Front, that idea of reaching out to nature and it being, you know, something in, intrinsic with death because he's, he's reaching out for the for the butterfly and like, and it, and it doesn't tally up exactly, but the idea of a kind of human need to to touch something natural as a as a touchstone of life and death, which I thought was really interesting. See, I, I was drawing the cherry blossoms. In my mind, it was the waste of men being lost in their prime, falling off, you know, as it were, uh, which, which I thought was slightly heavy because they kept re, redoing it. But but again, that, you know, Sam Mendes might just have liked cherry blossom. Well, I mean, the, the conversation of, oh, God, you know, they've cut them all down, there isn't going to be any left, is, is purely about they've cut down all the men, there isn't going to be any left. Um, but then the idea of, actually, don't worry, you know, the next wave will grow once the stones of the old ones have rotted is, you know, it is, it is reasonably heavy-handed. But it's also a nice way to have a conversation about cherry trees. It was, isn't there some move to plant the cherry trees as a commemoration to the war? Where did I read that recently? Did the French do plane trees? Did they, they try and recreate the, the, the avenues of plane trees or sometime in the centenary? Or am I thinking of something else entirely? I have no memory of that. There, there, was a, there was a huge stink in Sheffield when they were going to cut down some of the trees that were planted in the aftermath of the war as memorials. Do you remember that, Beth? I, yeah, I do, yeah. I mean, it was around about cutting down trees in Sheffield. Not all of them were these memorial trees, but the, the memorial trees in particular caused a, a huge fuss. I'm just wondering, Beth, in terms of your, your research, you're talking about landscape and men's relationship with nature, but... Um, some of the most vivid scenes in 1917 are cityscapes and the destroyed cityscape. And do you do you consider men's connection with the landscape of conurbations, if you will, for want of a better, or or, or urban livings, it might be you know villages as well as as cities? But you know, is that something that you look at in your research? Um, yeah, no, um, I was more focused on the natural landscapes, but um, I did actually find while I was going through um, some of the men's accounts, there were um, some really moving descriptions of um, when they were in the ruins of Eep. Um, and I was kind of really reminded of that with the scenes of Schofield um, at Acoust, which were just shot so beautifully with the light of the fires, you know, coming through the arches of the ruins. Um, and yeah, it's um, definitely um, men could have obviously feel connections to those um, urban ruins as well as you know natural uh, spaces as well um, and um, yeah you know I saw men um, talking about um, being quite sad at, at seeing how devastated um, it was and um, you know how kind of ground it had been before um, and I guess the religious symbolism of, um, of a cathedral and things like that as well yeah, I think I had another person talking about how it felt very much like a ghost place now because it, you know, it was all ruined and, you know, it just had obviously been the scene of such fierce fighting. Um, so, yeah, I think the urban landscape is really, um, really interesting material um, for, for first of all, as well. I was going to ask something similar because you were talking about how soldiers um, kind of reacted with kind of warm feelings of, you know, seeing nature taking over or kind of returning. What and similar with the cityscape, what happens in reverse of, oh, you know, I've we've been stationed here for ages, like we can see this beautiful forest over the side and it's lovely and it's, and oh no, the Germans have shot it several hours with artillery and that's all gone. So what what happens to, to the men write about what happens when they see the landscape that they have kind of has made up their kind of, their environment change in a negative way, whether that's, you know, we've been stationed at and it was really nice, it's becoming progressively less nice day by day or you know the, the natural landscape is being destroyed around us I think I saw um more most of that kind of in relation to um to things like the mud I mean obviously you all know from the accounts that there's so many of them um, and then men talking about that real demoralising feeling with those awful conditions. I'm not sure I saw so much of men talking about being in a particular area and, and then it then um, kind of going the other way and being more negative. 
but they certainly yeah did talk the other way around about negative spaces that were, were becoming more positive again but um, i'm sure there are um, examples of that as well it's interesting when you go to parts of the western front now to see which parts have been allowed to have nature reclaim them and which parts have been rebuilt so obviously you know Ypres is rebuilt completely i mean the, you know the ground outside is still trashed but if you go to parts of the Somme where they didn't rebuild the, sit, the, the villages and they're completely gone or if you go to parts of verdun where abandoned villages are things you can still go and kind of wander around with the, the the smashed ruins of houses and the like and they just never even tried to clear them or anything like that it's, it's which parts have been allowed to be reclaimed by nature and which parts have been repurposed again is quite interesting yeah and that definitely feels like something that was quite contentious for veterans where having spent so much time in these spaces and and having kind of learned these um, visual markers um of the landscape and how they navigated it and served in it and um, yeah definitely and um, there are examples of afterwards where there's these very differing views on what should be done with with these spaces um, and I think in one of the editor collections I read for my work um, there was a, a description in the 1930s of um, veterans having a, a big argument over an area of the Dun and how how far it kind of should be preserved to look as it did to them and how far it, or how far it should be kind of allowed to to have nature take its course um, and I think in one of the books as well there was a quote from um, the poet John Macefield kind of lamenting the, the loss of particular places and, you know, kind of giving the names of trenches that the men had once known. And now, you know, look, they're starting to be covered over. And is that going to then lead people to kind of forget what happened to us? And then um, it's also interesting in, in regard to the um, Commonwealth War Grave, War Graves Commission cemeteries where, um, you know, where they obviously made decisions on how to tend these spaces. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's not just the case of, nature has been kind of left to continue and um, you know they keep the the lawns kind of clipped of these cemeteries and they pitch particular flowers to to plant on there to represent the um the kind of which country is, is which their their war bid is there and things like that so it's actually quite an interesting debate which people had at the time and i guess people looking at it now as to how how far you can go um with with letting nature kind of just take its course and actually man-made changes or um preservations of kind of um yeah the, the way they pitched it during the war was that john pegum's article about war tourism i i have a feeling i've read that 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 article somewhere is, is that the one i don't think it was that one but it might have been someone talking uh, yeah on a similar line but i actually wanted to pick up on the, on the commonwealth war graves point um and that manipulation of the landscape and going back to that point you were making earlier chris about the the, the french looking at the landscape and saying to the British, you know, what have, what have you done with this? Because, of course, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, or Imperial War Graves Commission, as it was then, quite deliberately sets out to recreate English gardens in France and elsewhere. And this, this is, there is a corner of a foreign field that is forever England made absolutely literal. We can guarantee it because we've got spades and flowers and we're going to go and get it done. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so the human manipulation of the landscape and gardening, that which is, of course, what gardening fundamentally is becomes not 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 merely is it not preserving the landscape of war it's not even preserving the landscape of france as it existed before the war it is becoming something entirely new based on the fact that men uh, you know that that it has been given to the british government to, to commemorate the men who died it's you know landscape as commemoration i think is really fascinating um a really fascinating topic with a society edited collection after the conference, the uh, Landscapes of War book is just fantastic anyway, and it's super interesting. It's got one of my favourite front covers. Yeah, that that idea that the the ground is in some way able to tell us something. So, I mean, this is something that I imagine we'll explore further down the line when um, we do the computer game episode that I'm looking forward to, and maybe like three listeners are. Is that when they were making various of the games, a lot of the developers went and went to the place where the battlefields were to stand and listen, as in some way that the landscape would convey the information to them by osmosis, that you could stand on the Somme or you could stand at Verdun and, just, and, and hear the silence, and in some way that would inform you of what the battle was like. It's a very romantic idea, but you know, I've stood on the Somme and, and I've stood at Verdun and 
I didn't get that. Yeah, yeah, but if you'd said to your boss, I need to see what it sounds like, can I take a, can I go on an all expenses paid trip to the sum and stand there? <laughs> <laughs> and they went, yes, you'd be good. Oh, right, well, thanks. Yes, I will be back in three weeks. <laughs> and, 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 and it's an excuse used by historians, right? Because I, I remember going uh, with Jay Winter on one of his uh, field trips with his uh, Cambridge undergraduate special subject to Peron and and the Somme battlefields and and you know he made the case that, that to actually to to write histories of the war without having stood in the space where they occurred is difficult and problematic now as I increasingly am researching the Australian history of the war I'm wondering if I can use this in, as an excuse to get <laughs> research funding to, to go to Gallipoli but <laughs> um... I definitely think you can <laughs> We'll try. <laughs> but the army use exactly the same logic with their staff drive along trips to kind of go out and drive around the battlefields and the like, because, you know, you have to be able to see it from the ground to understand it. And back when I was working at the University of Kent uh, and friends of the podcast, uh, Mark Connolly and Helen Brooks took uh, their students over there. And there's a fantastic picture of them stood on like the parapet of a trench looking down on all of these like master's students who were kind of disappearing off down the line um, as if making for teep foul um, in, in July. And, you know, like three of them will come back and with the like, accommodations for their essays or something serious. Well, as, as we start to wander... <laughs> <laughs> Through the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think that will be a place that we, we wander off? Um, what are we looking at next time, Chris? Have we finally got computer games booked in? I really hope so. It's looking that way with a maybe uh, a recording in the, uh, middle to late April for release in the following month. And then I think we probably don't know what comes next. I imagine we're going to revisit 1917 in some way, shape or form, because this has been a really good way to kick it off. And at some point, surely somebody connected to Sam Mendes will be amongst our hundreds of thousands of listeners and will point um, in our direction so we can sit down and, and have, a, have a proper conversation about it. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Beth. That was uh, great. And it was, it was nice to be pushed to revisit the film, as I say. I'd I thoroughly enjoyed it second time round. I said to Chris before we started, I've never spent... I'd, I'd forgotten how long you spend staring at a man's webbing pack. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Until next time, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thanks, thanks everyone. everyone.